welcome back to Iris mm -hmm. After Hours. We love you guys. It's so good that you're back with us. And we have got our Papa back here today. Papa Roland. It's I'm, always a pleasure to have you. I'm just here to get entertained by you, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Nathan. Well, that is going to happen today, isn't I'm it, Chrissy? just hanging out. Chrissy is in the mood for a great podcast today. I can just uh -huh. tell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we've got the man of God, our mentor and my spiritual papa and your real papa, Papa Roland. Yeah. Welcome. Well, I just want to ask you guys some questions. Oh, come on. No. <laughs> come on. Absolutely not. Scusi? No. Scusi? No. Absolutely not. My special, I'm my trying special. to find somebody who's going to answer my questions. Yep. Oh. What are the big questions? What are the big questions that oh. we need to answer, Papa Roland? Well, what's come God on. made out of? You know, where did he come from? Where did God come from? Why yeah. is there a God? <laughs> mm, I'm not going to be helpful. Put your comments below right there. At all. <laughs> <laughs> I did used to think that as a kid. Where did he go from? God's been there forever, but how did he get there? Oh, when I was five years old, I was super worried about eternity. You know, what's going to happen when I don't have mom and dad anymore? <gasps> I was one serious kid. How did you know your mom and dad were going to hell? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Excuse that was, me? That was a, uh, Sorry, that was I was being a Papa Roland. He's trained me well. Uh, no. no. Did, but why were you scared of eternity without your mom and dad in case you died? You think you were going to die? Yeah, well, you, five, ten you, years you old, I, I knew I wasn't going to be around forever. I, I knew everything we see is temporary. I, I just knew that as a kid. So. But why didn't you think that your mum and dad would be in heaven with you? No, because they're going to get gold and die. Ah. Oh. They're not going to be around forever. In fact, I was upset because nothing we see is, is permanent. That's, but that, oh my gosh, you, you realize And I was a fine. photographer, you know, and I was taking pictures and I was realizing, well, you know, so you take a picture and it's done, it's gone, it's in the past, you can't keep it, you know, and... I was philosophically repressed yeah, as a 10-year-old. Because photos are like that. They capture a moment in life, don't they? Yeah, but then it's gone. Is, yeah, exactly. It's gone. You've got the picture but and the memory, but... Yeah, it's it's, it's done. I know. I, that, that still freaks me out about today, because when you've got little kids mm -hmm. and they're growing up and you see the changes, it's like, I can never hold my little Zebby as a baby anymore. He's not, Zoe, you can never hold baby Zoe. She's a little girl Zoe now. I'm just saying, as a 10-year-old, I couldn't stop thinking about eternal things. Wow. I've got a question for you. Papa Ron, why? <laughs> why did God choose to make us as kids? That, cause kid, because cause I'm never going to be a kid again. Like My mum and dad saw me as a cute little baby. I was very cute. <laughs> well, I must have been. Sure well, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but very clear. No one, the world will never have cute mm -hmm. Nathan, baby Nathan ever again. Because that was not even an eternity. That was just temporal here. So childhood is, why did God make this special time that is just here no. that is gone and it can never be recovered? Becoming mature as a Christian is all about growing down. Wow. It's not about growing up. It's about becoming a kid again. Ah. It sets us free. Nothing so to worry about. A perfect Savior takes the place of mom and dad. You know, you have all eternity. He knows the desires of your heart. and oh. He's going to repay you a hundred times over for everything you, you did and suffered for him. And it's all going to be okay. Wow. You can be a kid again. Gosh, so it's like it's like spiritually you get to go back there. A kid doesn't worry about where the next dinner is coming from, unless you're a refugee in yeah. Syria or somewhere. Uh, but wouldn't you like to be a kid again and absolutely not worry about paychecks or rent or that's, shopping? Or that's where I'm trying to be at the moment yeah. get, in my life. <laughs> getting your new car debted or, you know, just don't worry about anything. Oh, my gosh. Yes. I receive it. But I the want that. Apostle Paul said, do not be anxious about anything. So I looked up the Greek for anything. <laughs> means anything? <laughs> it means anything. Hmm. <laughs> like anything? Yeah. Absolutely anything. Wow. But, in every, but I mean, in, that's, a, like a, that's a slap in the fart show right there, isn't it, for, every, for all of us Christians? But in worry. everything, by prayer and thanksgiving... Let your requests be made known to the Lord, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, you know, have no anxiety, don't worry about tomorrow. Why be anxious like the Gentiles? Your Heavenly Father knows what you need. Yeah, look at the birds. Mm -hmm. Look at the flowers. And we went to Mozambique, to the poorest nation on the world, to preach that. That was the big conflict, you know. First of all, you take an impossible promise like that and then go to the people in the world that are least likely to ever know anything like that and 
Let's see how the two come together. That's the, that's the most ultimate test of the gospel we could think of. Whoa. And I think that was from the Lord. You know. Yeah. It's, it's the big thing Iris has always been about. Take this incredible gospel and take it to the neediest, craziest, most damaged, war, damaged, crazy, suffering, atheistic place with full of natural disasters and poverty, and see if the Sermon on the Mount fits, or, or Philippians three. For one, it's That's what three. the whole reason we went to Africa. <laughs> What's Philippians 3? <laughs> Have no anxiety about anything. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a rejoice. <laughs> I forgot. We're, this is for millennials, you know. They uh, gotta, <laughs> gotta, you know, read the Bible first. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so. That is crazy. Wow. That did you feel called to Mozambique specifically, or did you literally just look up poorest nation in the world? Well, Heidi, you know, was told by, by Jesus in her initial Holy Spirit baptism encounter in Jackson, Mississippi, I want you to be a minister and a missionary to Asia, England, and Africa. Yeah, but it's a big place. That's specific. People thought we were crazy to spend a lot of time in one place and then completely change and go to another place and then change again and go to another place. But that's what he said. And he said it to a woman. Very confusing. <laughs> oh, no. So we knew we were going to Africa eventually, and we'd already spent 12 years in Asia and three years in England. And it was time. Oh. So it started when we were sitting in Hong Kong, and you were about five. No. Younger. Four. Oh, I should have that picture. Three or four. Can we show the picture? <laughs> yeah, I see. he could. Mm. Ellie, go get the picture. We're going to show no, you. no. <laughs> Silliness. And I'm reading a Time Magazine article. I never heard of Mozambique. And it's talking about this war going on in this big East African country and how absolutely tragic it was, how unbelievably, unspeakably... Uh, crazy it was, is talking about um, United Nations trucks coming in to help the wounded landmine victims and all of that, and instead the rebels would just blow up the Red Cross trucks. Oh my gosh. People coming to help, humanitarian aid, medical care, and the rebels were just blowing up Red Cross trucks. And it was talking about all the other absolutely unspeakable things going on in the country. So I looked up, Heidi was in the room, and I said, hey, Heidi, <laughs> you want a real mission, Phil? Listen to this. And I read the article to her, and her instant response is, let's go there. They need us. They need help. And everything else is history. So That was in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So was London Kong. was in between. Yeah, we went to London next, because that's next on the list, and we had to, we had to study for PhDs. You know, I had to do that. Mm -hmm. In theology, yes, I'm very pleased. <laughs> Actually, you're not going off the track to find out what doesn't work. <laughs> but, but England was absolutely necessary preparation for Africa. Mm. We're dealing with street sleepers and, you know, um, really strung out people on the streets that were mentally ill or violent or, you know, really dangerous. We were told none of them would ever respond. They would just as soon slit your throat with a switchblade as listen to you. And, mm. But we found out eventually that that wasn't the case. We had a, after a while, we had a church for street sleepers called um, Believer Center. And it became a family, a real family. And these homeless people would walk clear across London for hours in shoes that they hadn't taken off in six months and crowd into our little flat, you know, it got really fragrant. <laughs> <laughs> and, and eventually we had a family and we all got together every birthday, Christmas, Easter, you know, and holidays and it would just become a real tight family. Wow. And it wasn't just street sleepers, it was also pinstripes business people from the city and, and and graduate students at the University of London were all mixing up together and rolling on the floor together in the Holy Spirit. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Mm. 
it prepared us. And you, you watched a lot of this. People pounding our doors at night, threatening to break in and slit our throats, and and uh, had mentally ill people, bipolar people, violent people, you know, grabbing Heidi on the streets and banging her against walls and beating her up because you know they thought she was a fake and a hypocrite and wouldn't give them what they wanted and all this and that. And a year later, they'd watch her all this time, just taking all this abuse and just loving back and. And eventually break down and weep and get saved. And wow. Mm. So all these t supposedly unresponsive people eventually responded deeply. Yeah. And, uh, and the researchers, you know, told us that this big tribe of the, of the Makua in Mozambique that we've been specializing with were unreached and unreachable. They said, you know, the fish aren't biting there. You're wasting your time. Go where the fish are biting. Make the most of your time. Go to the big population centers and go to the big cities, and it'll trickle out to the countryside. Uh, you know, start with pastors, luncheons, and businessmen gatherings, and government leaders, and, you know, have some influence. But everything turned out to be the opposite. The exact opposite, huh? Exact opposite. Mm -hmm. Lots of, we had lots of testimonies in London that, that encouraged us. Like one time, this guy from Scotland was really, really depressed. He, he'd re reached the total end of himself. And he's, he's on a freezing street in the winter in London in, a, in an alley in, in the dark. And finally, some guy comes by and just despises him and urinates right on him in the dark, you know, in his rags. and. And that was the end, you know, he was ready to commit suicide. He was just totally down. And he hears a voice, your Redeemer lives. And he kept hearing it. And he didn't know anything about who that Redeemer might be, but he heard that there was a group on the streets talking about some sort of stuff like that. And he found out where we lived. And he walked for hours across London, knocked on a door about six in the morning. I said, hey, I was just in the ditch and I, I've been hearing this voice for the last few hours. Your Redeemer lives. Can you tell me wow. who that Redeemer is? Oh and he got so full of the Spirit and got so saved. And, oh, my gosh. And this, that was our missions training it's ground. It's very clear, you know, very clear experience. It was stuff like that that, That's amazing. that prepared us for the Bush people of Africa. Goodness. So, what was your first experience going into Mozambique? Our first experience in Africa was Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Because you thought you'd go there first. Yeah, because Mozambique was still in war at the time. Mm -hmm. You had to sneak in. You had to swim rivers full of crocodiles to get into Mozambique. You, you, it was it was just really, really, really crazy <laughs> for outside. You couldn't get a visa. You had to sneak in. Mm. Gosh. So we tried to get as close as possible, which is the next country, but nearby, Tanzania, mm -hmm. and the capital there is Dar es Salaam. And there we met some people that wanted us to help them start a Bible school. But that's, you know, a very, very uh, tense area. Mm -hmm. You know, racially and spiritually and religiously, a, a very tense area between different religions, <laughs> to say the least. And so uh, the people that envisioned this Bible school were so security conscious, they started planning this Bible school with the idea of building thick walls like a castle with turrets at the top with guns and all to protect us from... You know. With guns? Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. The, the leader was from Korea, and he was a black belt kung fu guy. Okay. And, and his whole idea of a Bible school was <laughs> a fortress. All right. <laughs> we decided that wasn't going to be our approach. So, <laughs> But we did look up on the Internet trying to find the poorest country in the world, mm. and it coincided with that Time Magazine article. You know, it was actually Mozambique, right, right at the bottom rung of, of the nations of the world and quality of life and mm. per capita income and health care and you name it. Yeah, they had literally had 10 years of revolutionary war and 15 years Oh, they, had, they had 500 years of colonialism, 500 years of slavery, uh, world's worst natural disasters and flooding, communism, atheism, total collapse of the economy. 
AIDS, epi infrastructure. AIDS epidemic, uh, half the children dead before they're five. Oh my God. So, so many public buildings all blown out and bomb craters everywhere and no roads you can really drive on. <laughs> so. You had a pretty crazy <laughs> bombed out car experience, didn't you, when you first drove into Mozambique? Or a, yeah. a near miss situation? Yeah, our, 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 the truck I was driving in stopped running. This is from going from South Africa to Mozambique. Yeah, so yeah. we always had to fly into South Africa. Yeah, almost Africa, toward drive. the almost at the border, and I was so eager to finally get into the country of our mission's destiny. But our our car started to die. The engine started to act like it was getting gas and water in the fuel, and it just quit running right in front of the customs gate. But all of a sudden, a whole bunch of soldiers started yelling and screaming. A helicopter came overhead. Everybody's all excited. And we found out that the car right ahead of us that we would have followed had our car been operating was all shot up by bandits. And we would have been all shot up if, we had, if our car had worked. That and we right. pushed the car around, and it ran perfectly. And God just stopped it, you know, to save my life. And, yeah. Have I ever told you mm -hmm. that... A friend of mine has exactly the same testimony at the really? Brazilian Big Border, yeah. yeah. Nick, my, my brother's mm. wife, Mary, her, her mm -hmm. younger brother, Nick, mm -hmm. wow. he was doing missions work in mm -hmm. South Africa, mm -hmm. and they went to go to Mozambique at probably a similar time, mm -hmm. and their car stopped and would not start at the mm -hmm. border. Mm -hmm. and really? It, and then yeah. it was it was nothing wrong with the car, eventually, but they, basically, they, they, they're blocking it, mm -hmm. there was bombed, the cars that went through got bombed. Mm. Yeah. Wow. The See same road. story. I can't believe Nick was telling me, going, this is Roland's story, what are you... <laughs> What are you doing? Stop that was before it. the that was before the nice new N4 highway that you know about, you know, to South Africa. In those days it was just It was still dirt when I got there though. Yeah, when you first got there. It was Yeah, the road is just a rough old two lane road full of bomb craters and, and landmines and which means cars had to crawl through all the dips and holes and and that made it easy for bandits to jump out and get you. Of course. And it they're... took hours and hours and hours to go a few miles. There were so yeah. many abandoned cars on the sides of the road. Wow. Yeah. Like on that drive. Yeah, you, you would, would see just, just see bombed, like bombed out, burned out, cars, out just like buses along the way, all these carcasses of wrecks of cars all burned out. And gosh. It was really a war zone. And you got into the capital city finally, and there's hardly any cars on the road. It's like, it's like death. It was just quiet, no, almost nothing in the shops. And, Which is crazy oh. now, because it's oh. so. Maputo was never designed for all the people there are now. Yeah. It takes hours to drive. I, I used to spend two hours a day each way driving you to school. What? Uh, <laughs> just in Maputo? Yeah, just in Maputo from Zimpeta to their missionary school. Mm. Remember all those? the traffic was just chaos, wasn't oh, it? Oh, it's just intense, and it's, it's, it's worse now. <laughs> I know, because Maputo, I looked at the other day, it, huh? it's made the top 100 cities of the world. It's like number 99. Oh, right now it's full. Hey. It's the biggest cities in the world. Maputo made it. Now it's full of nightclubs and cabarets and street music and everything else going on. It, the magazines are now calling it the hippest city in Southern Africa. Oh, really? Yeah. Anything anything goes. It's like Havana, Cuba or something. You know, it's just whatever, you know. Yeah. <laughs> what a contrast, eh? Yeah, the... So when you got communist era is over now it's every man for himself <laughs> gosh the back alleys are still as poor and dingy and black and as they ever were yeah but there's all these new shops and hotels on the on the front side because it's, it's good that's right the water isn't it? but the bush where 90 percent of the country lives is still the same yeah they're still living like they did in the stone age thousands of years ago I know. Mud and stick hut, dirt floor, rope bed, an iron pot. And that's it. And animals. They live off the animals, chickens. They don't pigs, have any pictures goats. on the wall. They don't have a toothbrush. They don't have a piece. Of, never seen a piece of paper or pencil or a crayon. They just live off the... It's like going back into bottle time. Probably really, haven't had a, any sort of bath or shower or anything in months and years. They often have to walk hours just to get a bucket of water out of a muddy hole in the ground way off somewhere. Gosh. It's so different, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Two-thirds illiteracy rate. Uh, the average walk to a medical clinic was 25 miles, and then you, they don't have any medicine. Gosh. So we picked, <laughs> we deliberately picked the most broken down place we could find. 
That's amazing. The question is, what would make a person do that? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. <laughs> what would make... I'm glad you asked yourself the question. Why are missionaries missionaries? And especially why would, like the early missionaries, totally leave their home country and culture and family and never expect to see them again? And often didn't expect to live more than six months or so in Africa. And they would take, sometimes uh, take their own coffin with them. Yeah, they, yeah. My grandfather never expected to come back to the States ever. Wow. Hey, Jack. Well, neither did Heidi in 1980 and I. We looked like fuller brush people. You know, we, we were carrying everything we could carry. There was no weight limit in those days, you know. Uh, we came on that plane just bristling with stuff, you know, because we never thought we'd ever see America again. Wow. Carried everything we could possibly carry, you know, two 70-pound suitcases each and all kinds of carry-on, you know, they're sticking out and hanging on, tied on. <laughs> tied on, <laughs> I still strapped travel, on. I still travel like that now. Talk to my wife. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, that's just, like, that's just kids. Well, that's one just... time people gave us, gave me hundreds and hundreds of, of toothbrushes to take back, and I really did look like a fuller brush man <laughs> getting on the plane. Oh, all these hundreds and hundreds of toothbrushes. <laughs> And we brought them all the way there, and of course, pretty soon they're all gone, stolen, sold, you know, given away. Nobody had toothbrushes anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we used to bring forks and you know, plastic forks and spoons and all. There, they're all gone pretty soon. Gosh, it's a completely different world. Mm. But one time, I asked Chris, we, Mom, and I asked oh, you guys, yeah. and Elisha, where would you like to live? We'll go anywhere. You're more important than the mission field. What would you like? A nice, mm. perfect place in Singapore or Switzerland or That's nice. Mayfair, you know, <laughs> in London or Baja on a ranch or Montana or oh. anywhere. Yeah, yeah not bad options. Rocky Mountains. And, and you guys both said, no, we... Mozambique's our favorite country. Mom, you can't go anywhere. What about your visions? What about your calling? We are not going anywhere. Whoa. Silly, silly thing to say. <laughs> I lived in Manhattan. Yeah, we said no. We, I, we were actually very serious. We were totally serious because it was a little bit rough. We were almost hoping they would say... <laughs> Get you off the hook. Say some place like, you know, Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> mm. okay. Also a weird place to raise kids. Mm. Right, yes. Yeah, we didn't have a school. You know, we came there without any plans to how to educate you guys. And all of a sudden, Clyde Myers comes in. He was my teacher when I was in missionary boarding school in Taiwan. And Yeah, that's and, pretty crazy. And here comes right when we need him with a big container full of school supplies, and he has no way of getting into the country, but we had already been there a little a little while, and we got him introduced to the government and got him visas and everything, and he just shows up and sets up a, a great school, and it was like having no, a couple of PhD. Your teacher, your teacher from Taiwan, boarding Yeah, it was like having a couple That's of... Crazy. Isn't that bizarre? That is like... Uh, it's like suddenly God <laughs> providing a couple of PhD educators on the spot to It's a missions kids. organization that starts schools on the mission field around the world. Yeah. For MKs, basically. And they picked out Maputo just when we needed them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really bizarre. Can you imagine mom teaching you math and science? And no, people still say that. Like, <laughs> well, you were homeschooled, I guess, right? And I'm like, are you crazy? Like, <laughs> when would that have happened? <laughs> no. No, <laughs> and so she learned perfect Portuguese, and she even went to Brazil, and all her friends are Brazilian or Portuguese. and. and it was like her when she was in London. She developed a perfect Queen's English accent. Yes. Mm. Can you do that for a second? Give us an example. No, I really can't. Please, then, darling. I really And then can't. she goes to her grand... I'm still waiting for the home videos. And then she goes to her grandparents' uh, place in Montana, Kalispell, and, and in one semester gets a, a cowboy accent. Howdy, Mom. How's everything? You know... <laughs> I just lost it completely. Christy, what happened? I don't know. It's just so impressionable, you know? <laughs> and, 
and then Elisha, you know, he ends up teaching classes at that missionary school because he's read far more than the teachers, you know, in science and math. And, uh, <laughs> Come on. But anyway, what, what would make Christians take God so seriously? What is it about Christianity that would make people lose their lives for it and pay any price to be Christians? Whoa. What's it all about? Because you would think from a lot of teaching today that Christianity is a way to get rich, and it's a way to get favor, and it's a way to get blessing, and it's a way to take over, and it's a way to get what you want, and it's a way to control God, and it's a way to get your prayers answered, and it's a way to, you know, have heaven on earth. What would make someone move to Mozambique? Oh, yeah. Good question, Papa Roland. Mm -hmm. why, why, why to would, the poor. Why would people give up anything for Jesus? He's supposed to help us get everything we want. Why would we give up anything that he wants? Whoa, that's a really good why would we give up anything to have his way when his way is supposed to be our way? That's a good question. So I'm just saying there's kind of a divide in the church here. You know, it's kind of like a why in the road. Whoa. But one thing that the angels explained to my grandfather's kids in China in that outpouring, you know, in Visions Beyond the Veil. You we keep coming read, back to that. You have just to casual. Read, if you haven't read Visions Beyond the Veil, by H. <laughs> I think Bible, the angels on Amazon, told us specifically. We sell Irish. You have to read that book. It's a Christian must read. It's, it's small and not, you, read you, know, you can read it in a short it's time. It's profound. But, but you don't, you, big books don't actually. It's basically a testimony. It's testimony. You don't have to read a big, thick book to get really touched. Ooh. And you don't have to write a lot of books to have a big impact. Just one book like that. Mm. Because, mostly, it wasn't what my grandfather thought. It wasn't what he, <laughs> came, what, what he came up with. It was what he witnessed. It's, it's mm. what he watched. He couldn't do anything about it. He didn't mm -hmm. try to start it. He didn't know how to stop it. He didn't know what to think. It just was what happened. It's unbelievable. It's revelation. Mm. And it's one of the most thorough, long-lasting uh, outpourings of revelation on more people than I've ever heard of, actually, in church history. I've, I've actually never, in all of church history, heard of an equivalent to that. Really? As in certain, that many people so, going yeah, into yeah, an open it, I mean, certain mystics for a short while, like a day or two or at a time or something like that. But we're talking about a whole... Large, large group of kids off the street having visions all day long and all night long, week after week after week. Come, coming out of visions just briefly to get a bite to eat or go to the bathroom, and then they're back in visions the rest of the day. Not just one or two or three kids, but all of them having the same sort of visions. Mm, and a real consistency amongst them all. Total consistency, seeing all these Bible stories of the Bible. Which none of them knew. None of them well. ever heard of. Or at all. Anyway, angels came to these kids and said, your job on earth is to stand at the foot of the cross where the road divides in two. There's the narrow, difficult road that goes up the mountain, and it's full of trouble and hardships, and you have to navigate a lot of stuff, you know, like Pilgrim's Progress, and it's dangerous, and there's a lot of traps and temptations and hardships and warfare and trickery and enticement along the way. But that's the only way to get to the celestial city. Oh my gosh, that's so encouraging. Mm. I'm on the right path. Yeah, yes. something <laughs> seems right about my life. <laughs> yeah, we're all that's so encouraging. <laughs> then there's the broad, easy way that goes down to destruction. Whoa. And the big crowds of people all going down the big broad way they could see in visions. And it's easy, exactly. and lots of people are going that way. The vast majority of people are going that way. And, and the, the kid's job, the angel said, was to stand at the foot of the cross, you know, where you, where you find salvation, and warn and persuade people to the limit of their ability. Go out and persuade people to the limit of your ability. Talk to them. Do you see anyone coming back, you know, from that Broadway going down? Do you realize what's right around the corner? Don't you realize life is short? Don't you realize that everything we see is temporary? Don't you realize, you know, you need to think ahead? So true. Huh? Everything you can possibly think of to persuade people. That was the job angels gave our orphan kids. 
But you hardly hear that anymore. No, you don't. Whoa. Hmm. I'm thinking of uh, Jesus sending out the 72 to do signs and wonders, you know. Yes. He told them to go out and heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and, you know, freely receive, freely give, eat whatever is set before you, you know, just don't just carry a staff and sandals or not even a bag. Just go. And he empowered them to do these miracles, gave them authority. And they came back all excited. I mean, really excited. The demons are subject to us, you know, as they were just so thrilled at their signs and wonders and all the supernatural they were seeing. And Jesus says, I'm just reading here, I saw Satan fall like a lightning from heaven, you know, and I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. And then Jesus says, however, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, yeah. but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's the big deal. Oh, come mm. on. Signs and wonders are what we do along the way to help people, but that's not the big deal. Yeah, that's not the end game. Re why should we rejoice no matter what? What is the big deal that fires Christians and or makes them willing to give up anything? It's that their names are written in heaven. Oh. That takes care of everything. It does. It really does. And the whole point of missions is to share that. And if you have that, how can you not share it? That's if that is a and so whatever the price statement. is, Paul says, my life is worth nothing to me. I mean, how many preachers and ministers say that to the people? My life is worth nothing to me if only I can finish the task God gave me of testifying to the gospel of his grace in Christ Jesus. And wow. It's not about me and my life yeah. and how much I can enjoy it down here right away. That's not what it's about. What it's about is that 100,000 people are dying every day without any knowledge of Jesus at all. The lost, the truly lost. And, the, and what motivated my grandfather is the same thing that got us to Mozambique, which is Jesus' parable of the Good Shepherd. 99 sheep are in the, in the you know, they're all in the shelter and they're all okay and everything's fine and comfortable. But there's one out there on the mountainside somewhere in the cold and in the night and stuck in the briar bush. And, and he's determined to go out and find that one. And all the angels of heaven are more happy about him getting found than all the rest are all okay. And the 99 uh, wander away. Which is why my grandfather went as far as he could to find that last lost sheep in the, in the mountains of China. Tibetan, West China. He couldn't get any farther. He got three days' yak journey from the nearest white man. He just couldn't get any more remote. It's very remote. And yeah, she's been there. I will say, it's she, remote. But China's actually built a road there now. <laughs> yeah, but you, you can, can drive imagine. It we now, were just but... that whole trip. We were imagining what that w was like <laughs> in those days without cars and a road and. Yeah. He called there. It's out there. It's out there. It's amazing. Yeah, so that was what angels told my grandfather's kids, the Christian life in this world right now, mm -hmm. temporarily, is about. Whoa. It's not about just enjoying heaven right away and not worrying about anybody else and just, you know, living as comfortably as you can. And getting everything you want. Mm -hmm. We're in a war. The devil's trying to take as many people down as possible, separate his kids from God's kids from him. And we're created for him. We're created because God loves to be loved and he wants companionship and doesn't want to be alone in the rest of eternity. Come on. But man, we, we have an enemy on our hands and you look at the shape the world's in and you realize we are in some kind of fight. Yeah. And this is a war zone. This is not heaven right away. But we get down payments along the way. We get refreshment along the way. We yeah. get we get clued in. We get taste of the powers of the age to come. But hey, we're strangers and pilgrims here. Whoa. Scripture tells us to think about things above, not uh, things on earth. Yeah. Uh, for the things that we see are temporary, and the things that are unseen are eternal. We're patiently waiting for a kingdom not made with hands, kept safe in heaven for us. Yes. 
So that's what we're trying to emphasize in Iris. We're trying to get back to the basics of the faith once and for all delivered to the saints and get back to the real key issues and the real predicament that the human race is in. Is it, do you think it's, it's the mm-hmm. devil rolling that has got us off track? Seducing us with well, all the cares of this world and, and... Ultimately, actually, everything in this world is a distraction. Wow, from where that's we're a gonna, great statement. F- from where everything. we're going to be. Yeah. From I mean, really, purpose, First John yeah. just plain says, don't love the world or anything in it. Whoa. Yeah, but what about airplanes and fast cars and cannons. new computers and cannons and, 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 and babies and rainbows? and Flat screen. <laughs> Babies and rainbows. There's yes. a lot of good stuff down here. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and hot fudge sundays and tennis courts and beaches and, and, and family trips to Yosemite. And, and <laughs> Jeep. Cherokees. Jeep Cherokees and, and, and trucks. If there's a lot of stuff down here. And man, when I was 20, I didn't like that verse at all. I was interested in so many things. I subscribed to about 25 magazines just because I wanted to be inter- interested in, into all, all this stuff. That's so awesome, Rob. I you realize, recently. I you realize I was a f- and I didn't read one of them. I was going to say, I can't do you realize I was, a, I was a photographer? Ever. I was a photographer of Road and Track magazine and Cycle World and Sea World and Wow, Cycle World. Sea, Sea, yeah, yeah. And was, Sea World. Yeah, and Sea, C, C, C magazine, yeah. Ah, come on. Yeah, I met Heidi skiing. You know, that was another major interest. In snow skiing. That's where to find a missionary wife. <laughs> yeah. At least sometimes. Oh yeah, the snow is so much fun, isn't it? Yeah. But what's so it all about? Gosh, life, life is short. It's extremely short. And I think what the devil would like to do is for us to completely forget about the next life. Yeah. Just forget about it. To see how much you can get out of this life. He does a good job, doesn't he? Does an extremely good I have job. To, mm-hmm. I have to consciously mm-hmm. try to think about heaven in my life. And I try to get it in there but it's not like it's my natural thing well, my natural thing is whatever I see in front of me that's what I'm looking to it's mm-hmm. like yeah that, me too I'm I mean, going to be intentional it, 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 I used to have to force myself to pray and force myself to think about eternity and force myself to think about salvation and force myself to keep my faith in Jesus and and now I can't help it yeah. there's no way not to think about it you've, you've, there's no way to not you pray. You, you got to a tipping point somewhere. Well, I wouldn't say it was overnight. Yeah. I'd say you know I still I'm still growing day by day. Mm. Like I say, you grow down. You know, as you get older, you get you more realize how far short you fall of the glory of God. Wow. You, you don't get you don't get more impressed with your holiness. You get <laughs> more impressed with His grace. Wow, <laughs> that's a good word right there. <laughs> Shakababa. Well, maybe, maybe what happens is the illusions of making yourself get destroyed along the way. Your illusions of self grandeur get oh, yeah. uh, meet, meet um, reality along the path of There's the There's a verse in the Bible, Psalm 73 25, and of course I've read it all my life, but it took a long time for it to start meaning something, and now it means a whole lot more. Mm-hmm. And the author says, Who do I have in heaven but you, Lord? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. All right. Well, how many people feel that way? <laughs> that, that, that. <laughs> Can you someone please write a comment below? Right, <laughs> right now, sailor. How many people actually feel that way? That's a slap in the farcha. It's true, Roland. <laughs> The fact is that I think most people use Christianity for their own ends, not for the glory of God. Wow. They use Jesus because they want stuff that they love. (laughs) And they know they can, they think they can get it from God, get it from Jesus. Wow. It's not Jesus they love so much. I know where the lollipops come from, so I go to my neighbors and my kids do. uh, they, They think Jesus can give them what they really love. Yeah, and that's the deception there. And that's called... Prostitution. Mm. 
Well, obviously, if you need stuff, you should go to Jesus. You know, yeah. Uh, God's upset if you need things, and you don't go to Him. You go to other people. Or, yeah. But but it's not just that. If it's just that, why why pray if all the only reason you pray is just to get stuff? Yeah. Or to make things happen, or do a miracle, or something. You pray because you love God. You want to talk to Him mm. about everything. Communion. Absolutely everything. That's the whole point. It's, it's companionship. Christianity is about. It's a person. It's not a bunch of projects or ideals or you know amazing visions or. <clears throat> you just want that person so bad that nothing else competes. Yeah. Yeah. Apart from the gifts that he gives, hey. Well, quite, a, quite apart. Uh, yeah, well, mm. some people say signs and wonders are, the, are what Christianity is all about, and what we should be doing. But signs and wonders are just a way, they're just tools for us to benefit each other. Yeah. It's like saying the whole point of marriage is to wash the dishes, fix the house, and mow the lawn. Supernaturally, and I say no. It's about your spouse, you know. <laughs> it's about cultivating that love and romance, and that. It's not signs and wonders. Not not the end of themselves in the mm. Christian life, and it's not what we preach. We don't preach signs and wonders, and yet, among our churches, we've seen more there than anywhere. So like Praiser likes to say, we don't chase them; they chase us. Whoa. We can't get rid of them. Yeah, that's a good thing for people to understand about Iris, isn't it? Really? Yeah. Like there's a lot of supernatural I mean, stuff let's, happening, but it's not as if we're really facing that. There's no place that needs oh. health and wealth and prosperity more than Mozambique. Come on. But we don't preach health, wealth, and prosperity. Mm. No. But they follow. We put millions of dollars into Mozambique every year, and it's just getting more all the time. And now with the university and mm. everything, it's just it's just exponentially growing. Mm. But that's not what I'm chasing. Yeah. I'm just chasing Jesus, and guess what comes along with him? <laughs> <laughs> and actually, if you don't chase Jesus, you, you don't actually get a whole lot of all this stuff that you, you're trying to major on. Yeah. Because he doesn't want to. He doesn't want you to. to is want to sacrifice you and your best for and lead you into deception. How does Sarah say about the school and the gifts? She says something like, um, God doesn't want to... Your gift at the expense of you? Yeah. God doesn't want to get, give you, get, release you into your gift at the expense of losing you, uh -huh. losing your own soul. You know what the biggest challenge in Africa is, and come to think of it, is the biggest challenge anywhere. And that's the Sermon on the Mount again, when, when Jesus says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be yours as well. Yeah, add it unto you. Well, that's what's everybody at conferences and miracle crusades and the poor, everybody's trying to get all the, the other things as well. But until we see people literally starving for his kingdom and righteousness, I haven't seen real revival. <sighs> I mean, starving for it, where you'd just rather be perfect and holy and righteous and, and happy and pure and peaceful than anything. You don't care if your house is big or little or rich or poor or anything, as long as you have a pure conscience. And, wow. Mm. Gosh, that's where we need to be at, Roland. That's personal transformation. I mean, you just really don't care at all anymore. You have an old car or a new car or this or that. And, if Jesus blesses you with one because he loves you, great, but that's not where your heart is. You can't split your heart. You can't be after money and God both, Jesus said. Whoa, preach it, Roland. Can't have both. I hear both and more all the time. I've even heard of both and more conferences. And I'll just be really bold. We've had both and more Irish me events. <laughs> but I'm just sticking up for what I read here. <laughs> Come on, Roland. Keeping us on track. <laughs> Keeping us on track. Somebody write a comment. Please. Somebody write a comment. Now take Psalms 27 4. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek. Whoa. Now that it's just by itself catches my attention. Mm. Yeah. That's kind of important. I know. It's David, isn't it? Yeah. If, if, there's, if there was only one thing you could ask, only one thing you could seek, what would it be? What, what would it be distilled it, down to? 
And he says that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. And seeking him is the command most often given in scripture. Mm. Did he say? It's the first re requirement of God that you seek his face. That's what that and that's why it's our first core value. Yeah. God says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And so that should be the number one occupation of our life. It's not something you just do at one point. Now you're a Christian. Now let's get on with the business of changing the world. No, we continue to seek him yeah. because there's always, well, you know, I often think about how to motivate people to seek God more. But that's pitiful if you have to find a way to get people to try to seek him. If they don't have a, a river of living water coming out of them and they just don't naturally want him more, you, you can't make them. Mm -hmm. But a spectacular thing happens when God gets inside you and puts a spirit inside you so that you just don't want anything else but him. You're not forcing yourself. You're not disciplining yourself. You're, that's just all you want. Yeah. And that's a process sometimes, isn't it's it? A mostly, mostly. Well, it's a lifetime process. Yeah. But man, that's the direction to go in. Yeah, oh yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Because mm. then you actually going for what really matters. I mean, you, yeah. it's like that thing, the, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Well, that's, Jesus that's is pretty, that's, that's, Jesus is pretty main. <laughs> People mean? ask me, why do you talk about Jesus all the time? There's so many other things to talk about. And I go, really? Like what? <laughs> I know. I mean, that's the thing. How He's the creator. All good He's things came, come out of him, are in him, and there's no good thing outside of him. And all, yeah. th all good and perfect things are in him. Paul uses that phrase, in him, all the time. Mm. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I often say, we, Heidi and I want to do this, you know, and we feel this way in the Lord. And I add that phrase, in the Lord, a lot. Yeah. It's in him that we live and move and have our yeah, being and have our good attitudes and comprehension and direction. So Psalm 73 says, whom have I, well, no, back to 42. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, our God. Mm. And I'm not going to try to discipline and make and push anyone to do that. The ministry is really uh, mm. betrothing people to to Jesus. That's the matchmaking. That's your goal for Iris. You don't just tell people, "Hey, do this and that, and you'll go to heaven." You you need to betroth them to the Lord. Mm. It's not mechanical. It's not religious. It's it's an ultimate love affair, which is what life is made out of. Yeah, it's not. So the real question is, how much of a love affair do you have? The biggest sin uh, is not do you or do not want Jesus. The, the, the real issue is, do you want him enough? The Lord has revealed that. You know, the, the big complaint against the church is not that they don't want me. It's that they don't want me enough, he says. Hmm. I mean, it's like marriages, isn't it? Why do marriages end? Because couples get distracted and get the, their focus off of the desire of their partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or they get things come in, offenses or, you know, and that's, it's a, it's a very similar, I, just, I don't know yeah, if it's, we'll just put that thought in my head then. It's just, it's a similar thing, isn't it? Because it's, that's what marriage is meant to be. Marriage is meant to be about the love and desire. Well, that's a huge, huge subject in counselling and, and spiritual disciplines and all. Ultimately, is marriage really supposed to be romantic all the time, or is it just a kind of a vehicle to keep the family together and keep society going and you know and organized and keep us civilized? Keep us civilized, and, and and is it a, is it a living arrangement? Is it an economic arrangement? Is it a, a, a unit that keeps society together? And some you know historians, psychologists, anthropologists say, well, this whole idea of romance is kind of a new thing in history. <laughs> read, read Song of Songs, you know? Yeah, gosh. Why would God make us, and why would anybody go through all this stuff if, if it isn't for something worth dying for? I think the guy that wrote that was a 
s suffered some unrequited. And I keep telling people, don't was, don't so join sad. don't join Iris if you can possibly do anything else. And don't support so Iris. Again, so they get don't join Iris unless you can possibly do anything else. If, yeah, and don't support it either if you can possibly not. Wow. Maybe um, don't say that. No, still support them. <laughs> I would no, say. What is pointing? I would say that if you. <laughs> like, if you don't feel compelled to give by an, an, an inner spirit and uh, from God, uh, no, there's no point. Yeah. Hmm. Fine. <laughs> Come Just on. Just a little You're addendum ready. to your, 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 your little suffix on the end of this podcast. <laughs> but still do it. But that's Just kidding. Just kidding. But, but literally <laughs> what we're talking about, all is it, is it the transformation, the personal transformation, and your authenticity of your relationship with God has got to be primary before whatever happens out We just, Heidi and I decided in the very beginning we did not want to play the missionary game. If we couldn't actually demonstrate and live and preach the Sermon on the Mount. Let's just not even get started. Wow. Not even, not even get up and go anywhere. Mm. Not make a stab at it. It's, it's, it, we, we're going to love God, and we're not going to take any substitutes. We're not going to live for something else. We're not going to live for ourselves or our ambitions or our comfort or anything. There's no Plan B. There's no all the eggs are in one basket. If he can't take care of us and pay for us, and we're supposed to scrounge around and beg and act like beggars and, and just go to the church for everything we need and try to get all, everything we want out of other people instead of going to God for everything. So that's not worth it. We're not going to die for that and give our whole life away for that. No. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, the authenticity mm -hmm. of your journey. And so we're, we're, we're dead serious. In our early missionary trips, which are far more rigorous than, than anything we do now, I would do my best to talk people out of coming with us. We would need a group of 15 or so to go for six months, you know, around Asia. And anybody that tried to join us, I would say, you really don't want to come with us. It's, it's going to be way harder than you think, and, and you really don't know what you're getting into. We're going to be in communist areas of the Philippines and China, and here we don't know where where we're going to stay or what we're going to eat or anything. You you really don't want to get into all that. And, so good, right? And, and the more they, I did that, the more they would weep and throw themselves on the ground on the carpet and go and cry and cry and pound and do, we got to come to you. We're called. We have to come with you until we had 15, and then nobody wanted to come anymore. So. Hmm. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. It's always been that way. It's always been that way. So good. God Ron. has to provide in every possible way, or we're not going to play the game. And that's our second core value. We depend on God for everything, miraculously. Yeah. Wow. It's not that we hope he steps in once in a while to help out. It's, it's that the whole ball game is in his hands. Yeah. Wow. It's total dependence. You really have to trust your whole life with it. If you're not going to give your life for this, don't do it. You know, if it's not worth giving your life for it, don't preach it, don't teach it, don't write it, don't, don't go anywhere. How's that for? Don't go anywhere. Mother, <laughs> that is powerful. Comments below right now, please. <laughs> Gosh. That, Are you excited well, about anything specific in 2018? I'm excited about things that I cannot imagine and cannot dream up and don't expect. <laughs> because all these years I've realized all the great things that have happened are none of them were things that I were, was ambitious for or could have predicted or planned on. Wow. And what keeps me going is the fact that every day we have the potential of getting to know God better, which to me means things that are I never expected, better than I thought, <clears throat> could never have done on my own, could not have engineered, could not have... Yeah. Imagine orchestrated even could not have called into being because you know it's it's I want next year to be totally unpredictable. Wow! It's not like I want. I know, I know. Iris is a corporation now. We have vice presidents in six months, one year <laughs> budgets, budgets, and and plans. Oh, we are so put together. <laughs> But what I personally am really wanting is for God to do things we just did not expect. You know, just like God, just break us loose. Take us to places we've never been. Show us things we never understood. 
make everything better than we ever thought it would ever happen. Take us, just take us, and just show your glory, you know. Mm. By glory, I mean more love, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit than we ever thought possible. How, how that looks and how it's going to be done. Man, if I could predict it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be that. Mm. And it would be small, too, believe in it. We always go small. Yeah, well, I'm kind of the opposite. You know, everybody wants to, you know, us to take ownership of our lives and plan big and do great exploits and get out there and climb the mountains and be amazing. If all I care about is Jesus and all I really want to do is pray, <laughs> I'm looking for something better than anything they could have taken ownership of or made happen. Yeah, made by it's the hands of all that God, stuff not isn't, made by the hands It's of not man. that I want to reduce things, it's that no. those things are not enough. Yeah. Mm. Whoa. Never it's enough. Not, not, things, not Never that I want to calm little. down and be small Never and be little, that's not the point. The point is that whatever they're planning is not enough for my little heart. Whoa. Mm. You know, there's a song in The Greatest Showman. Yeah, that yeah. That. yeah. Remember that when yeah. the ladies are yeah. saying, Never enough. Never. Yeah, yeah, All the no. The, lights, da, da, da. the church as it is it right never, now. I always think that it'll never be enough. Like God, awesome. everything in this world, nothing will yeah. ever be enough. Whoa. No, the church as it is in this world is For not me. great enough. Yes. Whoa. And it's, the church's finest hour is not going to be when everybody's satisfied and everybody's comfortable and everybody has enough to eat and everybody's okay. It's going to become it's it's, the, it's greatest hour when we are the most challenged. Whoa. And we realize just how much we need God. Well, that in itself, mm. Roland, I need more comments right now. <laughs> the church's <laughs> finest hour. The what do you think? Finest hour when Whoa. God allows the devil to do his worst and we triumph over it. Yes. Mm. Yeah, and it's not going to probably look. But most of the church, the, I can't imagine that the church right now is, is, is its finest hour. <laughs> Whoa. I don't think we can sit down as a as a committee and decide what we think its finest hour is going to look like. <laughs> Probably true. <laughs> Gosh. Well. Overcoming. Well, it's kind of a. a you can well. see there's some different emphases in the in the church. I, I'm just saying. It's <laughs> great. I think we're pretty much out of time. Oh. Pretty much. Roland, oh my oh, just, gosh! Just, just reading some verses here. There's a lot of there's a lot of them here. Let's get a few more in the morning. Okay, perfect. okay. Oh. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoa! Hmm. I wrote a song about that. Thy, my, that was my very uh, most unfavorite verse all through Ooh. high school and that sort of thing. Really? Yeah. But over time, after seventy years, I realize. <laughs> It is no fun to try to create heaven around yourself and live for yourself. Yeah. It is just no fun. It doesn't satisfy your heart. It's hard, actually. It's hard always to be sticking up for yourself and trying to hang in there and gather stuff for yourself so you're going to be okay in the future and make sure nobody can touch it and build your little safe corner of life. It's, it's 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 you're under pressure. It's you know it's not going to work. You know you can't keep it anyway. But you try, try, try. It's it's not relaxing. It's not peaceful. No. But you're not really free until that's it. That's my life is yours, God. And that's it. I just deny everything. I'm not trying to get anything out of anybody. I'm not trying to motivate people, change people, get stuff out of people, get responses. Nothing. That's true. I just want to, just want, I know what I want. I just want him. Whoa. And I'm going to seek him. And that's going to be my business, my occupation, my calling in life. Wow. And if, and then his promise is that everything else will be added. Oh, say la. <laughs> <laughs> And I think about the first thing that the prophet Ananias said to Saul, you know, when he had his Damascus Road experience. And first thing God says, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. How's that for an introduction to the ministry? You've been a Christian for 
Three minutes. That's well, less than three days. Oh, three days. Oh, this is when he was he made it to town. Three days. Oh, yeah. Three days. And the, f the first thing God has to say is, I'm going to show you how much you're going to suffer for me. But the point is of all that. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> the point of all of that is that's actually the easiest path of least resistance. It is, hey. Give yourself away. It's actually easier on your heart to do that than trying to hold back and grab and keep. It's such, it's, it's so ironic. It's ironic, but it's, it's easy. It's a lot, it's the path of least resistance to follow God's will and do it his way and just give up your life for him and let him love you the way you need to be loved. Yeah. And be Man. careful and known like and if, no one else can know you. And if you don't want to suffer for his name, what it really means is that you don't want to love people. Whoa! Hang on, Sailor comments right now. Say that again, Roland. If, if you don't want to suffer for his name, what it really means is you don't want to love people, because comments right un now. Unbelievers love people who love them. Unbelievers yeah. like friends who are friendly Jesus with them. That, uh, yeah. I mean, what are, what makes us different than everyone else? Yeah. What makes us different is that God has put in us a life. That's His life that the world has never seen before. Mm. And we're willing to turn the other cheek, go the second mile, and be happy about it, rejoice in it. It actually is, is, is what the disciples kept saying. Paul says, I rejoice in my weaknesses, in my trials, and my problems, for when I am weak, I am strong. Whoa. And <laughs> we possess nothing, and yet we possess everything. You know? Yeah. And it's just the most freeing thing to absolutely give up your life and realize, I'm going to get everything. Whoa. If God did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, give us all things? Come on. That's what I tell the poor in Mozambique. Well, you're, you're poor right now, temporarily, and you're getting better, but hey, you're going to get all things. Exactly. Life begins. It takes a little bit of guts to go to the poorest, poorest country and say that to desperately hungry, sick people. But if we can't say that, why are we there? Exactly. Are we oh are we there just to kind of make their life a little bit better and do some humanitarian aid and give ho hope for a better life in this world, give them some education, say God bless you, you know? Give them something temporary that's going to run out, yeah, or yeah. you're going to give them something that'll never run out. Whoa! Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll never, no expiration date. If you don't give Whoa. them a faith, if you don't impart faith and a hunger for righteousness and a love for God, that that's above everything else. Then, what's it for? I mean, all the rich billionaires of the world are getting old and figuring they better do something good with their money. I would be freaked out. If I, I mean, I mean, I uh, I all these Hollywood stars are w working on water in the world and, yeah. you know, and working on the solution for malaria and all these different things. Mm. And it's all good stuff, but hey, not enough for me. No. Oh, never <laughs> enough. I knew never, that was coming. Never, I knew. never <laughs> enough. You You're getting into the feeling of it all. For me. You should just play us out, Nathan. This is the outro music. Never in love. I wish I knew the other lyrics. Yeah. Oh, the stars. What is it, Chris? <laughs> will never be enough. Towers of gold are still too little. Yeah, still too little. <laughs> Not going to sing. I mean, really, people who <laughs> preach. my hands, but it all. <laughs> but I could. Never be enough. People who <laughs> preach, you know, just never ending blessing and this and that in this life, I say, really, is that all you want? Exactly, but that's the truth. <laughs> wow. It's a short mm -hmm. changing, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it is a short Whoa. change. Cheers. Really, here's to... Cheers. <laughs> really light stuff. So that was the first two, <laughs> four values. <laughs> next time we're going to get to the next two. Whoa. This is clearly a podcast series. I need some comments I mean, below. Whoa. Clearly. We never even get through the whole history. I mean, there's just so much. I know. Just a touch on a couple just, of points. Just, just a <laughs> so good. Just a taste. It always <laughs> rang in my ears at Harvest School when David Hogan said, I just see God. That's all I do. I mm. see God. That's it. That's our job. I went, mm. wow, that's it in, in a nutshell. I'm it's not like, interested in making a career out of anything else, you know. God may have me do other things, but that's not where I set my heart. Mm. <laughs> 
I mean, he may keep us really busy doing a lot of stuff, but don't set your heart on those things. Yeah, yeah. Keep this world, you know, have a light touch, you know, he's knowing it's not, not permanent. And that's what, that's mm-hmm. what true freedom is, isn't it? That's what true freedom is. And mm-hmm. you're not bound by anything. You're just totally free to be his and to be with him. Well, spiritually In speaking, Paul says we, we die to ourselves. We're dead. And the great mystics used to say, you know, when you're really united with God, in union with him, you don't have any will of your own. You're not contending with him, not trying to persuade God to do stuff. You're not trying to fight with him. You're not say, oh, I just totally in union with the one I love and totally trust, and life's much more peaceful. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds odd. You know, people say, oh man, that takes a lot of discipline, a lot of you know self-sacrifice, a lot of self-denial. That's I, I'm not up to all that. But like I just said, that's actually the the path of least resistance. And yeah. Roland, thank you. <laughs> I mean that, and I'm sure I can hear a million thank yous out there. Whoa, thank you for mm. preaching the gospel. And look out for Roland's, look out for the latest Irish Media update where Roland is preaching this gospel in the bush bush in Africa. You can see he flies out in the plane. It's an oh, amazing it's video. Zam- Zambezia? Zambezia? Yeah, it's Zambezia outreach. Yeah, yeah, it's just out of Kalamani, okay. yeah. That was amazing. Yes, which you can find on our YouTube channel. On our song. channel. And thank you, we're at 10,000 subscribers now. And so on our app. We're going to visit the YouTube studios down in Colorado. Wow, that happened? Yes, it happened. Wow. We're at 10,000. That's awesome. Thanks to you guys. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's awesome. What a team. You guys are such a team. That's amazing. I feel like that was so casual. Where were you guys in the early days when we needed you? <laughs> we're going to do a giveaway. Are we supposed to give away DVDs or something? Mm. Yes. Hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Try to figure that we're out. We're going to work it it's out. Fine. <laughs> we're going to download awesome. them somewhere. That's exciting. Thank you for subscribing. You can also subscribe to our podcast. Christy, one more cheese, come on. On Apple Podcasts. My little one-year-old cheese, too. Little Ruben, he tries to go, cheese. Wherever you get your podcast. What a bunch of clowns. He does this, he goes, so cute. That's... He's cute. <laughs> and if you have questions you'd like to hear us ask or comments, please leave them like Nathan has said 15 times in this podcast. Yeah. You can leave comments. Did in you the like today's podcast? Comment I am section. Rocked. I am rocked. On our YouTube channel. Oh, you're on. You can also get the Iris Global app mm-hmm. to find all those video updates and, and podcasts. We will be back with Roland very, very shortly. There are more podcasts to come. Mm. With this great man of yes. Love you guys. Bye. This podcast is presented by Iris Global. For more information or to support the work of Iris Global, please visit us online at irisglobal.org. You can also text to give. Simply text the amount you'd like to donate to 530-338-3837. Or to speak to someone at Iris Global, call our office at 530-255-2077. Iris Global is an international Christian mission and relief organization with a focus on working amongst the poorest of the poor and those most in need. We hope this podcast has inspired your journey. Thanks for joining us for Iris After Hours.